We don't refer to a crash as an accident anymore. It's actually a traffic collision. The most crashes we've seen here is someone did something stupid. I've seen rear-end collisions, I've seen head-ons, I've seen broadsides, I've seen big rigs that overturn uh, where the wheels are uh, pointing at the sky. Uh, I've seen vehicles go off the paved roadway. So really, I've seen almost everything in terms of uh, types of accidents that may be out there. So nothing shocks me anymore. 42,000 Americans are killed every year. But the number of deaths when compared to the number of drivers on the road has never been lower. The dramatic decrease in auto fatalities is the culmination of research and development that has led to safer roads, quicker emergency response, and of course, better cars. Still, nothing in the course of human evolution has prepared us for the forces involved during a wreck. Frontal car crash is over in a tenth of a second. I have heard from the doctors that it takes about a tenth of a second to, to blink your eye. This is a crash about to happen. A driver speeds down the highway. Without warning, another vehicle pulls into traffic and the driver has a split second to avoid a collision. He stabs the brakes, jerks the wheel, and completely loses control of the car. Fortunately for everyone involved, this is a driving simulator that allows researchers to study the human factors involved in car wrecks. Most drivers aren't very sophisticated when they face a crash situation. They have, probably haven't been in one before, and so they tend to panic, and they'll stomp on the brakes, jerk the steering wheel, uh, close their eyes probably, and hope they don't hit anything. Uh, within any accidents, there's three factors you want to look at. One factor would be the driver. That's an obvious factor. You also have uh, the vehicle itself and, uh, and the environment. Bad weather, such as rain, caused an accident. The drivers of the vehicles tend not to change their habits of driving. They, they will maintain the speed, not knowing that does the stopping distance of their vehicle has changed. The reasons for crashes are nearly limitless, but some causes are more prevalent than others. In 2001, nearly 13,000 died due to speeding, while over 17,000 deaths were attributed to alcohol-related crashes. But the rules of the road every driver obeys are the laws of physics. During an impact, the human body is subjected to pressures and forces that seem otherworldly. An unrestrained driver weighing 160 pounds, crashing at only 30 miles per hour, can experience forces 45 times that of gravity, hitting the steering wheel and dashboard with a bone-shattering force of nearly four tons. The driver colliding with the interior isn't the only concern. Often, the car hits back. If part of your vehicle moves back, let's say, six inches inside, it moves back in a heartbeat. I mean, it's, it's instantaneous. That is a lot of force. If your body hits it at that time and at that speed, then you're going to have broken bones. You're going to have damaged organs. Automobile wrecks are difficult to study because every wreck is unique. But the application of science to a crash helps shed light on things that happen too quickly to see. From an engineering standpoint, crashes are judged by something called the delta V, or the change in velocity of the crash. People figure, oh, I'm, I'm going 60 miles an hour down the highway when I got into the crash. Well, you may have been driving at that speed. You typically apply your brakes, so you're down to, let's say, 40, miles per hour at the time of impact. You hit another vehicle and both vehicles continue to move. Um, so your speed going out of the crash may be 20 miles per hour. So you've really only had a delta V of 20 miles per hour. A delta V of 20 is usually life-threatening. And the higher the number, the more severe the crash. This test truck will experience a delta V of 50. Had a driver been on board, he would have been both crushed and torn to pieces by the twisting wreckage and brutal deceleration, and would have had almost no chance of survival. But survivability is the goal. Since the mid-90s, the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety in Ruckersville, Virginia, has been discovering how to build better cars by wrecking them. The most rigorous test is the 40 mile per hour offset frontal impact. You rarely hit somebody else head on, 
what happens is maybe you're going around a curve, the other car slides over the lane a little bit, and you clip the driver's side will uh, impact each other. And we do a test like that because it's more demanding of the vehicle structure. Engineers place the crash test dummies, part complicated scientific gear, part human surrogate, into the car the night before so their bodies can settle properly. The morning of the crash, engineers painstakingly align and attach the vehicle to the towing rig, a cable system built into the floor, powered by pressurized nitrogen. Photo specialists ready 12 cameras that will shoot stills, video, and high-speed film to capture nearly every angle of the impact. Minutes before the test, the dummy receives minor adjustments and a coating of face and body paint. Not for the cameras, but to help study the crash by marking where the dummy impacts the car. Finally, the control booth operator begins the countdown. Three, two, one. We're ready. As fast as the eye can blink, the car wraps itself around the barrier. And as soon as the pieces stop flying, the technicians move in to assess the damage. Basically, things look pretty good. We see that the occupant compartment is pretty stable. The basic geometry of the A-pillar and the roof rail has stayed the same. There's plenty of room in here for the dummy or an, a real person to survive. Car makers have taken notice of the Institute's testing and have changed their designs for the better. Only five years ago, few cars received an acceptable rating. Today, it is rare for one to fail. The tests have also dispelled some common misconceptions. Common thought would be that the stronger all the parts are, the better. The better you are able to survive a crash. But in fact, if you've got the strong parts in the wrong parts of the car, you can have problems. Here's an example of a a lower structure on, on the front of this van that didn't deform much. We've got a little bit of bending, you know, this turned up here, but most of this structure is intact. And what happens, because it's so stiff, and the parts of the vehicle behind it are, are not strong enough, it pushes back into where a person would be sitting. This is the floor of the vehicle. This is the brake pedal here and, and the front of the seat. And you can see how far that floor has been pushed back. Normally, there's enough room in here for your legs to be extended out to the pedals. But because the piece out there was so stiff and this part is, is so weak, it was pushed back into where the dummy's legs or, or the driver's legs would be seated. And you can see along with it came the steering wheel and steering column. This is all the space that's left for a person's head. In a crash of this severity with the structure collapsing in around the driver like that, it's very unlikely that a person would have survived. Manufacturers have learned to make some parts of the frame and structural support strong while purposely weakening others. Thin spots strategically placed throughout the car allow it to bend or crush predictably during a crash. These appropriately named crumple zones absorb energy and lessen the impact. Car design has advanced considerably. Not long ago, the bending and twisting of metal was a death sentence that early manufacturers had neither the ability nor desire to control. A fact that has cursed the road since man first combined motors and wheels. Actually, one of the first car crashes reported or documented uh, was in 1771 with uh, Nicholas Joseph Cuneau, who had a steam-powered vehicle and drove it into a brick wall. But the true car crash story didn't begin until the first gasoline, steam, and electric vehicles were built in the late 19th century. The accident started nearly as soon as the cars began rolling off the assembly lines. The first recorded traffic accident in the United States occurred in 1896. This was two months after the introduction of the automobile. Mr. Henry Wells drove into a bicyclist, and he ended up spending a night in jail as punishment for this crime. On September 13, 1899, we have our first recorded traffic fatality, and that occurred when uh, Mr. Henry Bliss stepped off a curb in New York City and was struck by a passing vehicle. Car makers paid little attention to safety features. The cars had wooden bodies, which broke apart on impact, and tempered glass, which, when shattered, 
broke into jagged, flesh-tearing shards. The first passenger car introduced in the United States didn't even have brakes. And you would actually stop the vehicle by running into a curb, and that would become your braking system. For many, these early cars were nothing short of death on wheels. Well, the first uh, traffic fatality that we know of happened on September 13, 1899, in New York City. Ten years later, 1,000 people a year were dying on the roads in the United States. Nine years after that, in 1918, 10,000 people were dying on the roads. By 1925, we were at 20,000. By 1930, we were at 30,000 deaths a year. And it shows just the explosive growth in the use of automobiles in the first 30 years of the 20th century and the numbers of people who died as a result. In the 1920s, the industry took basic steps to make the vehicle safer. The introduction of four-wheel hydraulic brakes, similar to those used today, meant that alert drivers could quickly stop the car to prevent a crash. Automakers also stopped using wood to construct car bodies, opting instead for something far tougher, cold, hard steel. In 1927, Ford introduced laminated safety glass. If you hit it, it didn't shatter into all these fragments that would cut your face and your hands and your arms. Uh, there was a sheeting of plastic between uh, the sheets of glass that held it together in a collision. So you'd get this sort of spider pattern when something hits it. Despite the major safety developments, increases in the automobile's power and performance outpaced all attempts to reduce the likelihood and severity of car crashes. America was on a collision course with one of the most brutal public safety hazards to ever confront the nation. And the death toll was about to hit an all-time high. The impact of crashing at 50 miles per hour is similar to hitting the ground after jumping from an eight-story building. Car crashes will return on Modern Marvels. They are considered our greatest generation. Now, a monument 10 years in the making is as permanent a part of the Washington landscape as their contributions were to our history. The World War II Memorial on Save Our History, Sunday, Memorial Day weekend on the History Channel. Brought to you by Bank of America, higher standards. Look what the old gunny's griddling up to your troops today. Good thing I just traded my blue rhino propane tank in for a full one. How we can grill enough for an army? Speaking of tanks, did you know that the M1 Abrams tank sucks down about two gallons of fuel per mile? You want to know more about this and some of my other favorite toys? Then tune in to Mail Call this weekend on the History Channel. Hoorah! The grilling man fears his ancient nemesis no more. I refer not to the double cut pork chop, the nuance of burger rotation, but to the empty propane tank. Yes, the grilling man knows the ways of Blue Rhino. As he swaps for the perfect full Blue Rhino tank, there is no sad goodbye, for drop, swap, and go is the brave new world, where the flame is always blue and the wieners never burn. Fear not, grilling man. Blue Rhino is at your command. I walked in the footsteps of emperors in Rome. I was lavished with wine and fine food in Malta. I was accustomed to a quick swim at 5. I dined promptly at 8.30. My after-dinner beverage was delivered no later than 9.45. I came to believe I was descended from royalty. Reacclimating myself to this world has been challenging. Be treated famously aboard a celebrity cruise. Call your travel agent or log on. In recent tests, the Mitsubishi Endeavor beat the Honda Pilot in accident avoidance. And during May, when you buy a new Endeavor, it comes with three years of free scheduled maintenance. The Honda doesn't. But if you already own one, that's OK. We take trade-ins. Triple Diamond Days. Buy an Endeavor before June 1st and get $2,000 factory cash back. You'll also get three years free scheduled maintenance. And as always, a 10-year warranty on an SUV you actually want to drive. Hurry, Mitsubishi's Triple Diamond Days and June at Mullinax Ford, our sales are up 27% from last year because our customers love the way we do business. We're looking to have a record month in May, so we've ordered extra inventory and are marking down prices to give you a better selection and more savings. Right now, just 18000 buys you a brand new F-150 STX with four doors, automatic V8 power, CD player, and a lot more. And all you pay is 18000 at Mullinax Ford in Apopka and Mullinax Ford Mercury in New Smyrna Beach. 
there's a group of little islands known for their power to restore your vigor and resharpen your senses. And while some say it's mystic, and others say it's magic, the secret we think is the water. Big Pine Key and Florida's Lower Keys. Do it for your own good. We now return to car crashes on Modern Marvels. By the 1950s, a record number of Americans were both taking to the road and dying on the road, with the annual average death rate reaching a staggering 38,000. So now we have vehicles really developed close to where they are today from a performance standpoint. They can really travel at very high speeds, uh, which is a lot of energy to have to absorb in the event that there's a crash. So the large number of vehicles on the road, the high speeds that they're traveling at, the frequency that they're out there, uh, we, that's where we see the increase in fatalities and injuries. The automotive safety engineers and the medical people have always told me that there, there are three collisions in a crash. The first collision is the vehicle. The vehicle itself is running into a barrier, a tree, another car, and it stops. The second collision is the occupant. You, the occupant, are in the car, and you must stop. The third collision is your internal organs, the heart, your liver, your brain. These organs must come to a stop also. Automakers began work on restraining devices to keep the occupant from impacting the car's interior and reducing the force of the body's internal collision. We finally had seat belts in cars. The very first one came around in 1950 in Nash Calvinator's Rambler. Unfortunately, they don't restrain the upper body, and so what would happen in a crash is the driver or the passenger would, would what's called jackknife over the belt, bend forward rapidly over the belt. You could get very serious injuries uh, because of this jackknife effect. In 1956, Ford introduced a lifeguard design safety package that included lap belts and special door latches to keep the occupant inside the car during a crash, as well as padded instrument panels to soften the impact. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, those cars didn't sell. And it sent a message to Ford and to the other US manufacturers that safety didn't sell. And we heard that tale for 20, 30 years afterward. Undaunted, in 1959, Swedish automaker Volvo introduced the single greatest automotive safety device ever created, the three-point seatbelt. Its development was largely due to a near personal tragedy when the wife of the chief executive of Volvo cars was injured in a crash while wearing her lap belt. Nils Bolin, who's the inventor of the three-point safety belt in, in the 1950s, he actually was working as an aeronautical engineer. And uh, at the time, the chief executive of Volvo cars, his wife had an accident. Chief executive simply said to Nils Bolin, we shouldn't allow this to happen any longer. Let's put it into production. Let's put it into our cars. Let's put it into every Volvo car and, and make it a standard equipment. In the following decades, every manufacturer would adopt three-point seat belts. The secret to their effectiveness lies in the ratcheting mechanism that allows the belt to remain comfortable and slack until the moment of impact. Inside some, a small weight pendulums forward during the crash, raising a flat metal bar, known as a pawl, into the teeth of the ratchet, halting the belt's release. Other mechanisms rely on a clutch lever attached to the seat belt roller. When pulled slowly, the roller spins freely, but when jerked, as in an accident, centrifugal force extends the lever and engages a locking pawl. But belts have always had one fatal drawback. They had to be worn to be effective a problem that has plagued motorists and manufacturers for years. In 1965, incensed by the auto industry's lack of concern, consumer advocate Ralph Nader published Unsafe at Any Speed, which chronicled the state of car safety. Pressed into action, the government created the Federal Motor Vehicle and Highway Safety Agency and passed both the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act and the Highway Safety Act of 1966 which established standards for all vehicles. In 1967, the first Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard was established. That was for seatbelt anchorages. 
but within 10 months, it was followed by 17 more standards. Everything from the sequence in which you went from park to reverse to neutral to drive to windshield washing systems to defrosting systems to requirements for hydraulic brakes, tire requirements, padding in the vehicle. Boom, just in a period of 10 months, from no federal safety standards to 18 new standards. With new government supervision and funding, scientists around the country began work on test programs to improve car safety. Some of the most spectacular were the newly devised crash tests, where new cars were wrecked to see how well they held up. Crash testing has been around for quite some time. There's some footage that actually shows uh, a crash test where the person is actually driving the vehicle, so it's not a very fast one, and it runs into the barrier. But the crash tests of the late 1960s were considerably more complex. Engineers designed a strange array of catapults, sleds, and solid barriers to test everything from door strength to the effectiveness of seat belts. We want to design features in vehicles that can protect an occupant. We need to be able to test them in a controlled environment and ensure that they're doing what we want them to do. And that's really where the concept of a crash test comes into play. Automotive scientists borrowed an idea first used by the Air Force to test ejection seats. And the crash test dummy was born. By the 1960s, these sophisticated lifelike mannequins had embedded sensors and were able to measure the forces experienced during collisions. In the 1960s and going into the 1970s, General Motors, working through Wayne State University, began to develop more human-like crash test dummies. In the mid-1970s, General Motors came out with the Hybrid 3 dummy. The Hybrid 3 dummy is generally considered the most human-like, the most biofidelic crash test dummy that we have. What we're looking at here is a cutaway display version of a Hybrid 3 dummy. This particular Hybrid 3 dummy is shaped in size to represent an average size male. He's about 5 foot 9 inches tall if he could stand up and weighs about 170 pounds. The Hybrid 3 family includes smaller dummies to represent the population spectrum as well as larger versions to represent bigger people than, than this dummy here. The dummy is made of different kinds of plastic and metal and rubber. Starting with the head, we've got three little sensors here, these little red things that measure motion of the head. We call them accelerometers because what they really measure is acceleration. Moving down into the chest, you can see that the dummy has ribs. These ribs are made of metal and they've got a plastic material on the back to make the, the movement of the ribs more like um, movement of ribs in a human being. And we have sensors attached to the back of the dummy's spine that also measure acceleration. We generally collect measurements from about 30 different sensors. And all of those measurements are recorded by the data recorder, which is sitting inside the dummy's chest here. With these new tools, engineers performed thousands of crash tests. Almost all were filmed using special high-speed cameras that allowed researchers to scientifically study every nuance of a car crash. The forces that they witnessed ranged from dangerous to deadly. I've heard people make statements that they're able to brace themselves in, in a collision. They don't understand the collision force is so high that you cannot bench press uh, five times your body weight. It could be 10 times your body weight, 20 times your body weight. So uh, these collision forces are, are that high. By the early 1970s, the best protection against these forces was still the seatbelt. Unfortunately, less than 25% of the population wore them. A major factor as the nation's annual death toll hit an all-time high, over 55,000. Scientists in the late 1960s, realizing that drivers and passengers weren't buckling up, began work on a restraining system that worked automatically. In the early 1970s, General Motors began testing the new technology, airbags that deployed upon impact. Powered by small explosive charges, the bags inflated quickly enough to provide a soft barrier between the occupant and the car's interior. Tragically, the bags inflated so quickly, they occasionally killed small women and children. Over the next 30 years, automakers refined the airbag deployment system. 
yet some of the newest technology was there from the very beginning. The very first generation of airbags were actually dual speed airbags. The ones that General Motors put out in its test fleet way back in 1973 had dual inflation speeds. They went off at a lower force at a crash speed of 12 miles an hour and a much bigger force at a crash speed of 18 miles an hour. It's ironic that 30 years later, we're finally going back to do exactly the same thing again. In the mid 1980s, anti lock brake systems were created to give the driver more control. Just before a crash, drivers typically stomp on the brakes, sending the car into an uncontrollable skid. The anti-lock system increases and decreases the brake pressure, allowing for the maximum amount of braking without locking the wheels and sending the car careening off the road. But despite tremendous leaps forward in making cars safer, both government and industry realized better cars were only half the battle the roads themselves would undergo a long and winding evolution to make them safer and ultimately save lives. Between 1900 and 1953, over one million Americans had died in car crashes, nearly double the combined American deaths in both world wars. Car crashes will return on Modern Marvels. Plane crashes on Modern Marvels, tonight at 10 on the History Channel. The History Channel and Microsoft present a favorite modern marvel, Space Stations, by daring to dream. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal of landing a man on the moon. The impossible became reality. And we have liftoff. These are the champions who persevered. Our space program has been one of the chief incubators of new technology. And created an engineering wonder. It's just part of the job. This favorite modern marvel is brought to you by Microsoft. Your potential, our passion. In recent tests, the all-new Mitsubishi Galant outperformed the Toyota Camry in acceleration and in braking. See how it stacks up against their free maintenance program. All oh, right, they don't have one. Triple Diamond Days. This month only get three years free scheduled maintenance when you lease an all-new Galant for just $2.39 a month for 36 months. And as always, get a 10-year warranty on a car you actually want to drive. Hurry, Mitsubishi's Triple Diamond Days end June 1st. This year, he'll spend 32 hours trimming bushes. 61 hours mowing the lawn, 52 hours watering flowers. But he won't have to refinish his deck for another four years. Bare premium weatherproofing wood sealer and finish with silicone. Four year protection against rain, sun, wind, and snow, guaranteed. Bare, get it right every time. Have you got your good years? Stop in now while all Goodyear tires are on sale. Buy four selected Goodyear tires and get up to a $60 rebate. Keep your car in step. Get your Goodyears today. Isn't it nice when things just work? And you feel confident you made the right choice. Delta. Beautifully engineered. Ballpark Franks, be big, be me, be Frank. You want to split something? Nah, I'm actually pretty hungry. What are you going to get? I'm thinking turkey leg. How about you? I don't know. Mm, just a T-bone, I guess. The world isn't made for low-carb eaters. That's what I'm talking about. He's nice. That's why there's new life choice. Generous portions, great taste, few carbs. Life choice, now in your grocer's freezer. Saturday night is movie night. Horatio must choose between the woman he loves and his duty to destiny. Come with me. Horatio Hornblower, The Wrong War. Saturday at 9 on the Biography Channel. I just got him down, so I'm quiet, OK? We got to fix this situation. I know, I know. If your family needs room to grow, come to the experts at Countrywide. Get upfront approval in minutes and close your loan fast. It's that quick and easy. Yes. Realize your dreams at Countrywide Home Loans.
Call or visit us today. We thought it was going to be a, a cakewalk. And I said, we're going to catch hell. D-Day, the 60th anniversary, begins Tuesday at 8 on the History Channel. Plane crashes on Modern Marvels, tonight at 10 on the History Channel. We now return to car crashes on Modern Marvels. Roughly 30% of all fatalities on U.S. roads happen not when two vehicles collide, but when a single car leaves the road. Engineers at the Texas Transportation Institute are working to change that. Today, they are testing a new bridge railing meant to keep out-of-control drivers from leaving the road and ending up another statistic. The test will involve a speeding pickup truck. 1,200 feet behind me today is the vehicle that will be impacting this rail. What will be guiding this vehicle into the rail will be a cable guidance system, and pulling the vehicle will be the tow truck you see behind me. The pickup will be traveling 60 miles an hour into the rail. The test crew makes last-minute preparations and checks the high-speed cameras, which will capture all the action. Finally, the tow truck driver is signaled to begin the test. seems to be a resounding success. Upon impact, the truck's path is redirected onto the track. It did contain and redirect this vehicle. If this had been on a bridge or an overpass, it kept it out of the traffic that would have been below the bridge, or had it been over a body of water, it kept that vehicle on the roadway and redirected it. So in terms of performance, this rail was a success. But the test vehicle tells a different story. We got some damage on the pickup truck that we certainly didn't anticipate today. And this damage is caused by the rail. And the contact surface of the, the railing with the vehicle was probably contributory to making the uh, wheel go into the compartment and create less living room, we call it, inside the vehicle. And this does this by the floorboards going in towards the occupant compartment. And we're fearful that this would cause lower limb injury and more serious injury in a driver or a passenger. The test crew reviews the high-speed video and finds the problem. The joints where the railing is held together snag the vehicle, causing the crash deceleration to be much more violent than expected the rail will need to be redesigned. There's nothing like uh, running a test. We can do a lot of analysis. Uh, we even do a lot of computer simulation now these days, but the proof is always in the pudding. Today, government agencies and research institutes take road safety very seriously. But throughout the first half of the 20th century, lawmakers adhered to a philosophy that was both pragmatic and dangerous. One of my colleagues uh, referred to it as the nut behind the wheel philosophy. Really, up until the 1960s, there was not a lot of attention given to vehicles that ran off the road. There was kind of a widely held philosophy that if uh, someone ran off the road, it was their fault. They did something wrong, and so they could face the consequences. Drivers at the turn of the 20th century never knew what to expect when they took to the road. In some areas, asphalt and concrete was the norm. But most of the nation was a loose collection of dirt roads. Roads both helped the accident situation in the early days and contributed to it. The extent to which they held down speeds, obviously, people weren't going fast enough to get into real serious crashes. On the other hand, uh, the quality of the roads, the, the geometric design of the roads, the shoulders, the curvatures were very primitive. And so when you did get into trouble and ran off the road, you were very likely to run into a tree or into a culvert that hadn't been properly engineered for automobiles. Deadly hairpin turns at the end of long straightaways or drop-offs on the side of the highway were common killers. In the early 1950s, the spread of the interstate highway system under President Eisenhower led to an outpouring of funds for research and testing. To make the roads less dangerous, the Federal Highway Administration was created to regulate their construction and safety. One of the first and simplest road improvements was the clear zone. We realized that people that were leaving the road 
Uh, it was not always their fault. Uh, we needed to uh, try and uh, keep them safe. And one of the most basic things that we did was begin providing uh, what became known as a clear zone or a clear recovery area on the side of the road. When space wasn't available, road builders struggled to shield natural hazards too large or costly to remove. From the clear zone concept came a wide range of physical restraining and impact devices meant to keep the cars on the road. But natural hazards weren't the only problem. Any object on the side of the road can become a potential killer. During high-speed impacts, signposts rip through cars and bring them to a lethal stop while a roadside mailbox can decapitate a driver as efficiently as a guillotine. In the 1960s, we began to develop breakaway sign supports, and one of the most successful devices that is still in use today has become known as the slip base. It was developed here at Texas Transportation Institute. It essentially provides a slip plane that allows the pole or sign support to release from its foundation and rotate up and over an impacting vehicle. Other safety devices, such as guardrails, developed over time. Some of the earliest were simple poles connected by steel rope. Often they did as much damage as good. Throughout the 50s and 60s, the designs were improved to keep pace with the changes in vehicle speed and design. Once the actual guardrail design was brought to a point where it was functioning well in the field, there was now this new problem that surfaced with the guardrail ends. And we found that these stand-up or blunt ends, as they became known, could spear a vehicle. And we actually have some instances where the guardrail beam element actually went through the engine compartment and through the passenger compartment and out the rear of the vehicle. So obviously this was a very nasty problem. And uh, there was a lot of research devoted to this in the 1970s. One early remedy involved bending the rail ends down. But that caused vaulting or launch problems. Another solution implemented by many states in the early 1980s used guardrail ends called breakaway cable terminals. Though better in some instances, when struck, the railing twisted erratically, occasionally entering the car, killing the occupants. The Texas Transportation Institute developed a better solution in the late 1980s, when after exhaustive research and testing, engineers designed the ET-2000, an energy-absorbent end cap. It was the first energy-absorbing guardrail end treatment. And essentially, it looks like a box that's placed on the end of the guardrail. And what that box does is it dissipates the energy of the vehicle. The guardrail beam element is first flattened and then deflected out of the way. And this flattening and deflecting process absorbs the energy of the vehicle and brings it to a safe stop. Today, there are railings, decelerators, and barriers for nearly every roadside obstacle. From simple sand and water-filled containers to breakaway railings. Still, engineers continue to test and improve the technology in the name of road safety. But even the best-built railings can't prevent crashes. And when they do happen, it's the men and women of the nation's fire departments that are there to pick up the pieces. A study by Harvard University estimates that drivers using cell phones account for about 6% of highway collisions, killing 2,600 Americans every year. Car crashes will return on Modern Marvels. It's the worst single plane disaster in U.S. commercial aviation history. 271 on the plane and two on the ground were literally vaporized. Paralyzing the airline industry by grounding every DC-10 in operation. What caused the crash of Flight 191? Tomorrow at 8 on the History Channel. This Memorial Day, we shall liberate Europe. We shall restore freedom. This is our purpose. I'm not sending a bunch of fresh young kids from Iowa and California to die on French beaches for people they know nothing about. I'm asking them to die for freedom. And they're ready to do it. And that's why they're heroes. Tom Selleck, Ike, Countdown to the day premieres Memorial Day at 8 on a and &E. In recent tests, the all-new Mitsubishi Galant outperformed the Toyota Camry in acceleration and in braking. 
Now let's see how it stacks up against their free maintenance program. All right, they don't have one. Triple Diamond Days. This month only, get three years free scheduled maintenance when you lease an all-new Galan for just $2.39 a month for 36 months. And as always, get a 10-year warranty on a car you actually want to drive. Hurry, Mitsubishi's Triple Diamond Days and June 1st. Dear DirecTV, your service is great! Crystal clear picture, programming guide, it's just so great! Nothing could ever describe DirecTV better than the word great. Maybe wow, but no! Great works best! Sincerely, Chris Copensi. Wow, great. Great wow. Get over 125 channels for $29.99 a month for six months, plus equipment and installation for up to three rooms free. So I bought a grill last summer, and when I got it home, it didn't work like I thought it would. And then it fell apart, which really bummed me out. But this year, I bought a Weber grill, because they don't skimp on construction, and it comes with at least a five-year, 50,000 burger warranty. And that's a lot of burgers. Mm. Log on to Weber.com and learn what makes a great gas grill. Both car and road safety. Over 3.4 million Americans are injured in motor vehicle crashes every year. Getting immediate help to victims is literally a matter of life and death. The combination of modern rescue and extrication equipment, the tools and the training and the professional people that use them, and the modern medical procedures that are now permitted in the field by paramedics, there's no question in my mind but what they're saving a lot of lives. And I say that with the experience of having lived through it before they came along. Today, fire crews arrive on the scene with a full arsenal of extrication gear. Right in front of me is uh, some of the equipment that we have on this paramedic unit. This is known to a lot of people as the jaws of life. We have the spreaders, which are used to get into a door. And these are the, the cutters. We usually use the cutters for cutting uprights. Uh, also, we use this to cut the hinges off the doors. Basically, this has about 60,000 pounds of cutting force. The ram unit is actually used if we have a person entrapped in a vehicle. In most cases, it's usually the dash that's entrapped on the patient. We can actually use the ram unit to push the dash away from uh, the victim. Since the very first car wreck, accident victims have been at the mercy of emergency medical crews. Well into the 1930s, firemen with no medical training arrived at accident scenes with only pry bars to dig the victim out of the twisted metal. In the early years of my career, when we were equipped with fairly crude and rudimentary equipment, we'd roll up on the scene of an auto crash with victims that were pinned in the vehicle, and we knew that we'd be able to save their lives if we could just get them out. But sometimes it would take so long to basically remove the vehicle from those people that uh, they died, and it was very difficult for us to take. Some of the greatest advances in emergency medical treatment would happen not on the road, but on the battlefield. By the Korean War, medical technology had progressed to the point where the combination of field medic, ambulance, and mobile army surgical hospitals, or MASH units, were saving soldiers so severely injured that they would have died in previous conflicts. The lessons learned on the battlefield were slowly implemented on American highways. By the late 1960s, Technicians revolutionized roadside treatment by miniaturizing medical equipment, such as defibrillators and EKG machines, once large enough to fill a hospital room. Today, the medicine administered at the crash site helps to keep a firm grip on a fragile life that would otherwise slip away. While fire departments work to save lives, law enforcement must contend with the social and legal ramifications of car crashes. I am a member of the MAID team. MAID stands for Multidisciplinary Accident Investigation Team. Uh, we respond to the most complex, severe accidents. A lot of the members have extensive backgrounds in engineering, physics, lamp analysis, and uh, by utilizing our training, we're able to find the causes of, of these severe collisions. For the MAID investigators, tools often associated with engineers augment the usual police equipment. I'm going to set up my, uh, my survey equipment, see if I can get some of the evidence here. And what we're doing is uh, I have the officer point to, uh, to, to the tire friction mark or the skid marks. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have him aim that prism at me. I'm going to take the point, and I'm going to get to uh, all the evidence and get all the measurements. 
After the field measurements are taken, the accident investigator returns to the station to begin reconstructing the scene in the computer. Most of the crashes in the Mate archives are massive multi-car pileups, which test the officer's engineering and mathematical skills. In this particular accident, we had to uh, survey over 400 points, uh, 57 items of evidence, uh, basically it involves 15 vehicles, two on one side and 13 on the other side of the freeway. Uh, what happened here was that uh, a big rig uh, got into a crash with a passenger vehicle on this side. Uh, as a result, the big rig uh, lost control, uh, compromised the, the wall between the, the traffic lanes on both sides, northbound, southbound side, and actually went through the barrier wall. Uh, and struck th th another 13 vehicles, causing one fatality. Uh, after um, taking the evidence and bringing it back to uh, our office, we were able to uh, reconstruct how this collision occurred. But sometimes the data analyzed by the investigators is more easily obtained. This piece of equipment is also known as a black box. Um, most newer vehicles have the black box, and uh, when a crash happens, this is a valuable tool for a, a crash investigator. What we do is we retrieve the, the item here, and we connect it to a crash data retrieval unit. We're able to see some of the parameters in a crash, such as uh, vehicle speed, engine speed, throttle position, and brake switch, which uh, if the driver's braking or not braking prior to the collision. Together, law enforcement and emergency medical personnel are on the front lines, responding to thousands of crashes every day. Particularly difficult to witness are the accidents in which the drivers could have saved themselves if they had simply buckled up and followed the rules of the road. Looking at this diagram, in this particular case, uh, it was one vehicle. It happened to be traveling excessive speed of approximately 50 miles an hour. And also the driver was uh, intoxicated. Approached a, uh, a stop sign, uh, didn't see it until it was too late, and struck a solid wall, causing fatality to three of the, the, the five occupants. If he was going the legal limit, which is 25 miles an hour in a residential area, he would have stopped his vehicle prior to the, the intersection. But if some futurists and engineers are right, that type of accident may soon be a thing of the past. Every year, Americans falling asleep at the wheel are responsible for over 100,000 crashes that injure 40,000 and kill over 1,500. Car crashes will return on Modern Marvels. Plane crashes on Modern Marvels, next on the History Channel. Now on home video from the History Channel, own your copy of this program delivered directly to you for just $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop historychannel.com. In recent tests, the all-new Mitsubishi Galant outperformed the Toyota Camry in acceleration and in braking. Now let's see how it stacks up against their free maintenance program. All right, they don't have one. Triple Diamond Days. This month only get three years free scheduled maintenance when you lease an all-new Galant for just $2.39 a month for 36 months. And as always, get a 10-year warranty on a car you actually want to drive. Hurry, Mitsubishi's Triple Diamond Days end June 1st. Can I tell you a secret? My man takes the Vitra. Let's just say he notices a difference in the the experience. Like, uh, we should do this more often difference. And why Levitra? Levitra helps improve erectile quality for men with ED. For my guy, Levitra works fast. And it gives him the quality response that he wants, time and again. It's why he counts on Levitra. Levitra is only for men healthy enough for sexual activity. Do not take Levitra if you take nitrates for chest pains or alpha blockers for prostate problems or high blood pressure, as this may cause an unsafe drop in blood pressure. Side effects may include headache, flushing, and stuffy or runny nose. In the rare case an erection lasts for more than four hours, seek immediate medical attention. My man takes Levitra. It's about the quality. And for him, Levitra works. Just look at that smile. Talk to your doctor today, Levitra quality when it counts. Now that Barb and I are both regular, we're free. Have you been injured in an accident? Dinner in a box. Depression and hair loss are not uncommon. I take Zekra and it's batter up. Just three minutes a day. Three minutes a day. You too could have abs like Mindy. All it takes. See, baby, there was something wrong. Hear 100% commercial free music on the most listened to satellite radio service. Beyond AM, Beyond FM. XM Satellite.
In 1936, we believed in the Pledge of Allegiance, the Golden Rule, and in God we trust. Today, Heinzelman Ford customers still believe in old-fashioned values. Believe in Heinzelman. That's why Heinzelman received Ford's 2003 President's Award. And right now, get 0% for 60 months and save up to 5,000 on Explorers and F-150s. Save up to 6,500 on Expeditions. Heinzelman Ford, Orlando, your low overhead dealer since 1936 and still the one. Believe in Heinzelman Ford. When it comes to service, Central Florida Toyota has just what you're looking for. For. And right now, ask for our TV special. A genuine Toyota oil and filter change for just $9.95. Guaranteed in 29 minutes or less. Or your next oil and filter change is on us. Make your next service appointment at Central Florida Toyota today. Two miles south of the Florida Mall on Orange Blossom Trail. Or one mile north of the Greenway. We thought it was going to be a, a cakewalk. And I said, we're going to catch hell. D-Day, the 60th anniversary, begins Tuesday at 8 on the History Channel. Plane crashes on Modern Marvels, next on the History Channel. We now return to car crashes on Modern Marvels. At the National Crash Analysis Center at George Washington University, engineers are pioneering the newest form of crash testing, which involves digital models, and some of the most sophisticated computers on the planet. Their goal is to test cars, roadside safety devices, and human interaction, all in the digital realm. The detail of these models is staggering. For a recent creation, a minivan, half a million points were painstakingly scanned into the computer. But once imported, the advantages of a digital crash test become clear. Instead of running one crash test at 35 miles per hour, we can do it on the computer at 15, 20, 22, 25, all the way up, and that ensures that our designs are working at all stages. For some of the tests, the supercomputer performs over a trillion calculations, analyzing force, acceleration, and deformation of the different elements involved. But computers are not relegated to the laboratory. Advanced electronics are appearing in the vehicles, to help keep the driver's eyes on the road. One of the really exciting things that's already here, but uh, it will grow in popularity, is night vision. That is to say, using uh, a means of recognizing objects that you cannot see with a naked eye. Miniature night and infrared cameras are being tested that see into the darkness to display the road and all potential hazards far beyond the headlight's reach. But the future of car crash prevention technology will involve mitigating the single greatest threat, the human driver. Volvo has begun the process with new technology developed for its next generation of sports utility vehicles. Due to SUVs having a higher center of gravity than other vehicles, they're more likely to affect a rollover. We've created a system called a Roll Stability Control System. And Roll Stability Control basically monitors the pitch of the vehicle or the vertical inclination to roll over. It does that by using a gyroscopic sensor located here underneath the armrest of the vehicle. This sensor works with the vehicle's dynamic stability and traction control system to activate the brakes and cut back on engine power to make sure the vehicle stays upright as the car goes through evasive maneuver. For engineers, the true test of the technology is done on the road and involves a fiberglass moose. What we're about to attempt here is called an evasive lane change maneuver. In Sweden, it's called a moose test because the moose is the most populous animal in Sweden. We're going to approach the moose at a high rate of speed and make a sharp turn, just like you would if an animal or a person jumped out in your way. All right, here we go. We're accelerating up through the moose course headed straight towards the moose. We're getting over 45, 50 miles an hour. We're gonna swerve, the system's gonna work, and back we come. As you notice, there is almost no squealing from the tires. The braking system works perfectly, making sure to manipulate the brakes in just the right sequence to make sure the vehicle stayed stable and upright. The distant goal for car engineers will be the creation of a system that will monitor not only the vehicle being driven, but also the other cars and potential hazards on the road. In the future, radar and sophisticated computer control systems will take over for drivers to prevent everything from simple fender benders to multi-car pileups. 
We're seeing radar being used in something called adaptive cruise control. Um, the idea is the old-fashioned cruise control. You set it for a speed, and then if you came up on something, you had to disconnect it yourself. You had to tap the brake. Uh, now we have radar systems. We have them right now, radar systems in cars that look ahead. And when they see you're coming a little close, at a preset distance, they'll leave off the throttle. They'll maybe apply the brake gently. If things really get out of hand, they'll alert you with a light and with a warning that says, hey, you're on your own. You better take control here. But some experts have almost as many concerns as commendations when it comes to new electronic safety devices. Those of us in the safety business are concerned about how drivers actually react to the new generation of safety equipment. This started with analog brakes, where we didn't see the kind of reduction in crashes that we expected. And the question was, well, why is this happening? We don't quite know, but there's enough evidence to suggest that there may be some driver adaptation. People think they're safer, and yeah, drive a little faster. Yeah. Maybe don't wear your safety belt, because you got analog brakes. Why do you need a safety belt if you're not going to crash? You'll notice, though, that none of these things, as clever as they are, take the driver out of the loop, nor should they take the driver out of the loop. You know, none of these things can repeal the laws of physics. Perhaps one thing every car expert can agree on is that if drivers simply pay more attention to the road, lives will be saved. Here we're on the freeway, and just in the last uh, couple hundred feet, I've seen three people on the cell phone. People looking at themselves in the mirror, adjusting their makeup, their radio, not paying attention to the road, and all they need is have a person in front of them to slow down. If you're not continually paying attention to your driving, uh, you're asking for a collision. And without question, the single greatest safety device to ever grace an automobile does not rely on radar, gyroscopes, or supercomputers. The simple click of a seatbelt has saved more lives than any other safety device. And experts believe if every American simply buckled up, over 10,000 men, women, and children would be saved every year. It is the worst single plane disaster in U.S. commercial aviation history.